text, we've got a man who needs no introduction, which is good because we don't have a lot of time to introduce somebody, and you probably know him already. So I'd like to welcome you to the stage, Charles Montgomery, and happy to be there. Um, okay, so I'm supposed to be the happy guy and get you all cheered up and go every morning and I, I couldn't help but feel extremely angry during the last presentation and I'm uh, going to be gracious in the event. Uh, hold my thoughts on that, but I'm actually going to charge a little bit by something else I heard earlier this week. Um, and, uh, okay, so I live alone and I'm a single guy and um, I'm on Tinder and I'm having a chat with this handsome dude, and I'm like, so are you, you going to go to placemaking week and go to some of the events around pro, 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 and <laughs> this is what I get. Uh, he's not going to come because it's just not relevant, it's annoying when there are people dying, uh, starving, uh, addicted on our streets. He's talking about the inequity and the urgent unfairness in our city. So I was totally deflated. Uh, we didn't go on a date. <laughs> and um, we kind of got me thinking, you know, here you are. Uh, <laughs> this is what people think of us today. And actually, to be honest with you, I was kind of feeling sparkly and rainbowy myself. But like, the gathering of the tribes, we're all going to be here. We're going to go on the bike parade. We're going to have the street parties. We're going to chase the things. We're going to feel wonderful. We're going to hug. And uh, he's right. So it got me thinking about Vancouver. So for those of you who are outside of Vancouver, and I know most of you here don't live in our city, and you're just thinking, my God, it's so beautiful here. You're doing so much right. It's so connected. Well, yeah, we are. But if you're not following local news, what you may not see, so let me introduce you to our city. Uh, we have a crisis of homelessness, and it's getting worse. By the end of this year, I think Councillor deals it. something like 2,000 people close to that will be uh, living on the streets or, or close to it in Vancouver, dis despite our efforts. Uh, we have a crisis of, uh, of people being pushed out of our city. The middle class is being pushed out. If you, this, is, this picture is a year old, right? So last year, you needed a million dollars to buy more Vancouver. Now we're up to 1.7. I don't know. It's getting, it's a nightmare. People are being pushed out of the city. This has implications. We are having a crisis. People are dying on our streets. We have a crisis of addiction and overdose deaths. I think now we're up to 78 in the city of Vancouver this year alone. And we know that all these things are connected, uh, particularly on the idea of addictions and overdoses. This has to do uh, to a great degree with social disconnection and lack of social support and connection to our city. So, how are you feeling now? <laughs> Not very happy. Um, Thinking about my, my Tinder friend, and, you know, and he's, he's right, and he's right in this way. If we are not activists, if we are not working towards cities that are more fair, that are healthier for everyone, that are more inclusive, then we're failing. And if you're not working towards that, here's what I suggest. After this, you just leave the conference, the gross grind is there, go hike, put on your little lemon, and have a great time. <laughs> or, let's work on this together. So, um, okay. <sighs> Calm down. Uh, okay, so I, I spent uh, 10 years being super poor in order to write this book, looking at the connection between uh, urban design and human health and happiness. Now I'm really lucky to be working with a team of people here and around the world who are looking specifically at these connections. And, um, our work has led us to conclude that indeed the way we design spaces and cities and systems has a tremendous effect on health and happiness. And indeed, our cities are designing our well-being. And when I'm speaking about happiness, I am talking about everything that matters to human well-being. And we need to start repairing the damage we've done over the last hundred years and create places and systems that nurture all of us. So, um, I did mention the word happiness. And so when I do that, typically we're talking about happiness and mobility and placemaking. You know, first you have to define what you mean by this word, happiness. How do you measure it? 
we've been thinking about this for a couple thousand years, since the time of Aristotle, right? Um, we kind of went off track a couple hundred years ago in the Enlightenment, when uh, scholars tried to measure pleasure in pain and they failed, and that's when our friends, the economists, stepped up and said, don't worry, we got this one, right? Um, you can't measure pleasure or pain, but let's just watch people spend their money, and that will tell us what makes them happy. Which, that sounded pretty reasonable at the time. Um, so now we have a world where war, cancer, divorce, all these things are supposed to be good for human well-being because they increase economic activity. Um, the economists are yeah, uh, coming around. And so, uh, sorry, do you have any economists in the room? Hands, hands up, please. Yes, okay, economists here. What does this mean? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate what you're thinking. Uh, this is from uh, Gary Geiger, the Nobel Walker Prize winning economist. So the economists have been coming around. And here we go. Um, uh, this is an equation to explain uh, the evolutionary happiness function. So we're all going to try to get happier by getting more stuff and growing our own social status. And it's going to work for a while. And then it's going to stop. We'll go back to where we started. And we're not going to be any happier in the end pursuing that uh, of happiness. So huge downer from the economists. Um, in fact, we're, we're lucky that we have scientists and researchers have actually been searching for evidence on the connection between uh, environment, behavior, human bodies, and, uh, and human well-being. And we're learning a lot. For example, we're learning uh, that people who say they are happy actually have better health outcomes and more productive at work. They live longer. So, you know, happiness is not such a bad thing. Maybe not such a, a bad uh, compliment to GDP. Um, so I want to tell you what we, my team and I do. We, uh, we pull lessons from various disciplines. So, we're pulling from public health, from psychology, from neuroscience, uh, and behavioral economics, because the economists are now using data from neuroscience, from other fields, comparing that to societal and environmental conditions. And they're starting to learn some things about how the world actually works. We're learning from sociology, and we're learning from other di disciplines, including things like performance art, actually. Um, so, uh, I'm not going to give you the recipe for urban happiness today. There's no time. And there's this awesome book you can read. Well, there's a sale outside here for only half an hour after my talk. I'll sell my books. Um, but I want to talk about what matters most. And then thinking back to my, I can't call him my friend. We didn't actually meet. This person's uh, critique. Um, what matters most to urban well being? And it's actually pretty straightforward. And the words I've mentioned already today. We know that social connection matters more than anything else for happiness and for health. We know that people who are socially connected, family, into friends, again, more productive at work, uh, more likely to survive cancer, they get sick less often, uh, their communities are more resilient, they live on average 15 years longer than people who are socially connected. So social connections do matter. It's not just unicorns and rainbows. Um, or, uh, Oh, yes. Never hold that point. Um, we know that superficial contact or light contact out in the city matters just as much as contact with family and friends. So this is research from Elizabeth Dunn at UBC. She sent her, her slaves, slaves, students, um, um, uh, to measure, uh, to measure the effects, uh, the well-being effects at the end of the day on people as they had social interactions through the city, superficial interactions. And the people who maximized those casual encounters with people they didn't know so well uh, were just as happy at the end of the day as people who were, were spent a lot of time with family and friends. So this, this means a lot. And this was true also for, for introverts. Um, we know that there's a strong correlation between social trust, trust in neighbors, and happiness or, or subjective well-being across Canadian cities. And if here you see, if you don't know Canada, you know that you know St. John is a humble little ville on the other end of Canada, not very wealthy. And our big, rich cities are all down at the bottom of uh, life satisfaction and trust in neighbors. And you know, my East Vancouver socialist buds are like, see, money doesn't matter. Money really matters. It's just that the social aspect matters more. It overwhelms it. Um, coming back to that notion of health and well being, mayor of oh, Enrique Peñalosa, who's finally been reelected. Uh, yeah, mayor of Bogota, when he insisted on using the term to make a happier city, when he, his program was based on the notion that the city must include everyone, it must welcome everyone. He had no evidence at this time to actually back up what he was saying. But in fact, he was right. There's this powerful connection between inclusion and societal well-being. You know, read the spirit level in the UK. Um, and this comes right down, now we're learning there's a relationship between inclusion and brain activity. I have a little hard time explaining this one. Okay, 
full disclosure, this is a most brain not human's brain. Um, but what they're learning that in, in all kinds of mammals, when you are uh, uh, low in social status, it increases feelings of social isolation. It changes the networks in your brain, and it makes it harder to re-engage. We also know that people who are uh, either excluded or low in status, they die sooner, even if they get the same health care benefits as, say, in the UK. So inclusion really matters. When we're talking about sociability, think about uh, uh, that notion of status and being included. So we know that our cities are actually designing our social lives. Um, Something I'm kind of sad about, well, very happy about, but sad about, I can't talk to you about all the super duper cool experiments we've been doing over the past couple of years on looking at the sociability and well-being effects of public spaces and cities. Because we're experimenting on you this week. Uh, we are working with the Urban Realities Lab, the neuroscientists at the University of Waterloo, along with MODIS and the city of Vancouver, on this super cool experiment, and I should be recruiting it right now, but I don't need to because um, it's totally booked out. Um, so if you're really desperate to join, uh, maybe you could sneak by the sign-up rooms at one of those times listed here, and if there are dropouts, you can join in. Anyway, which is just to say that uh, I can't tell you what our experiments has to be a little bit priming to those of you who are participating and it will change the results. So do you understand? Is that okay? Okay. Um, but other people are learning things. We know, for example, from studies in Italy that uh, people over age 50 and women are taking fewer antidepressants when they live in walkable, connected neighborhoods. We know, we can extrapolate from work by the great Larry Frank out of UBC who found this uh, negative correlation between uh, floor space uh, ratio, FAR, whatever you want to call it, density, and sense of community, you know, positive correlation. Um, the extrapolation is this. What we figure is that the more parking you have in front of buildings, the less people's sense of community and connections is. And the reasons are pretty obvious, right? Pretty intuitive. Back to Chicago. Remember what I mentioned? People who died in Chicago in the heat waves had one thing in common, it was social disconnection. But as people began to dig into the data and the urban connections over the uh, years after the, that terrible tragedy, what they found was that you take two neighborhoods, both of them poor, different urban fabric. One is a connected neighborhood with lots of small shops and services, things for people to go to. The other one destroyed by the uh, high modernists, big box, you know, wide roads, etc. The death rate was 10 times as high in the disconnected neighborhood. So again, we're talking about uh, public health and saving lives here. Um, thinking about the place making side here, uh, uh, just up the street here, I don't know which direction I'm going. I mean, we need to look west, over in the west end. Yeah, you can walk out if you stick around this weekend in the farmer's market. It's lovely. It's drawing people out into the streets. And that's all very raw, raw, raw. But if you really want to understand the power of place making to improve well being in a city, don't go there. Walk east. I want you to walk east to this on Saturday. Or a council would be on Saturday or Sunday? Sunday. Every day. It's a big mess. This is uh, on the downtown east <laughs> side. This is, it really is. It's Canada's poorest postal code. And for years now, uh, vendors, scavengers, dumpster divers have been appropriating the sidewalk to create their own market. And it is quite messy, it's quite gritty, it's intimidating uh, for American friends who don't understand that not everybody out there has guns, right? Because you might think so. <laughs> um, but now this has been formalized and you're taking, uh, you're taking a public park to do the same thing. You know, this is a public health intervention. People who don't have living rooms, people who live in hotel rooms down there, are using public space not just to trade, not just to uh, make a living, but they're coming together, developing community in these spaces. And we as a city, yeah, yeah thank you. That's so right, just to shut you down with your big applause. Yay! <laughs> um, you know, we as a city can learn so much from this neighborhood, even as we endanger it. So um, I think it's worth stepping back and, and talking about who are the original place makers. They are usually people who are vulnerable, they are usually people who are threatened. Here in Vancouver, uh, in the downtown east side, uh, this was an old a uh, department store called Woodward's that was shut down in 1992, I believe. The neighborhood was in decline, 
And of course, we wanted to do what we always do here. We wanted to build condos and lots of them. We wanted to get rich off this site. People in the neighborhoods said, hell no, there was a squat, they got kicked out of that, they built a tent sitting around, and they said, you're not getting rid of us. And they were so persistent that finally, various levels of government, the provincial government, maybe the feds, the city of Vancouver, a university, um, uh, nonprofits who deal with issues of homelessness and housing, and, uh, and uh, well, even some developers, all got together to create a solution. And here's what their solution looks like. Uh, this is Woodward's. If you're from other town, you must visit this weekend. Uh, corner of Hastings and uh, and, and Carol. Yeah. So what you see is you see market condos, fancy market condos at the back there. You see uh, subsidized family housing on the right. You have housing for the hard to house. These are people with mental illness, drug addiction, people who who uh, tend to be very hard on the building. Uh, you've got a university, you've got offices, you've got grocery, retail, it's all there. And you're thinking, why are you talking to me about housing? Where are the police meeting in and mobility people? Because of this. It's all joined together in the middle by this fantastic public space with very expensive, high status public art on both ends of it. It's a covered place. Why? Because you may not believe this if you're not familiar with it. Actually, he's here in Lindsay here. He's going to start in three days and never stop. <laughs> so, this is a living room for people who don't have a living room. This is a space designed specifically to welcome all people in the city. As long as you are not using it, as long as you have a needle in your arm as you walk in, you're, you're welcome here. You should be if not going to tell you that you're going to do something about this. Um, I don't even agree with it. Anyway, um, this is actually interesting because when one third of our nation got together a month ago, oh, Canadian woman just spoke to burst into tears at the mention of the tragedy there. Um, when we got together, this was the place that so many of us got together to watch this concert that was broadcast nationally. And you look around that room and you see the full spectrum of our city. Everybody was there. Everybody was welcome. And it was a beautiful thing. Um, okay, so thinking again about that Tinder message, um, thinking again about inequity, who's included and who isn't included. It's such a treat for you all, and I hope you enjoy your, walk, your walking and biking tours over the next few days, looking at the wonderful things that are happening here in the core of the city. But here's what we know, is that our cities are becoming places, uh, places where more and more people, unfortunately, are being excluded from those experiences. Cities around the world are becoming more dispersed at, at a rate of something like 2% per year even as core cities get better. Um, so it's a question of equity. Who enjoys this experience? Who enjoys a healthy, connected, walkable ease that people enjoy down here? Well, fewer and fewer. And so looking at the well-being effects of systems of mobility and urban planning, we can't get past that. It's important to consider. We know, for example, that uh, driving alone on a long commute, the further you go, in time, the lower people's self-reported well-being tends to be. The longer we drive, the unhappier we are. Uh, why is that? <laughs> why is that? <laughs> yeah, you're looking at yourself. Right? Um, the Vancouver Sun reported that people who are driving are, are reporting experiencing more rudeness and disability than people moving in any other way around the city. So that's only part of the negative well-being effects of driving or any kind of long commute. The other part is this. I'm not going to explain this. It just gives you a hint in the morning. Um, Keywords, American geographers, millions of data points, big American cities, what did they learn? Uh, the greatest uh, factor limiting people's ability to meet in big American cities is very simple. They call it dispersal, the degree to which functions of the city are spread out across the miles. So as we talk about building wonderful micro spaces, People are being left out because they have no access to those spaces because they're stuck in their in their in their vehicles or on buses. So um, it's important to discuss really briefly the system effects of these kinds of uh, uh, kinds of places we can build. I'm going to go through this really quickly and get back to the social. Um, because we have some Americans in the room, let's pick on you for a while. We're looking at the Atlanta region. Atlanta, you used for all better than anybody else. So on the on, on the left, you've got Mableton uh, out on the fridge. <laughs> fridge. 
Oh no, the fringe. Um, this is the place where you try to get an A to B and you punch it into Google and Google's like, uh, well, there are no sidewalks if you're walking, so don't bother. Um, and then you have um, Midtown, uh, north of downtown, right? A close, walkable, connected neighborhood. I don't know, think um, West End or think uh, West Fourth, uh, medium, medium dense, uh, near a dense neighborhood where you can walk to all of your needs. It's all connected to the park is there, the trend is nearby. Uh, super fast, what are the system effects of these two different neighborhoods? Again, partly because of the great work of Lawrence Frank at UBC, we know things like this. Um, you're going to emit, emit two times uh, the greenhouse gas living in the dispersed neighborhood. Boom. Spend twice as much just getting around. Uh, uh, coming back to the Vancouver region, thinking of that data point, we talk about unaffordable building in this city, and people say, well, you know, all you have to move, do is drive to qualify, uh, move up to the edges. Well, look at this uh, extremely ancient piece of data. And I say ancient because housing prices here have gone up more than 20%. Uh, in, in the last year. So 2015 is old, but Anne and Yan at Big Tom Architects analyzed this. The blue spaces are million dollar homes in Vancouver. And you think, well, let's just go out to the birds. Let's go out to auto, auto drivable land and uh, let's see if we can afford it out there. The blue dots are all over the place as you head out into the nodes in our agricultural land reserve. It's more expensive to live out there. So people are being made vulnerable by this extreme cost of transportation. Okay, you're going to weigh 10 pounds more because you can't walk anywhere. You're going to die three to five years sooner because of diseases of affluence. You're going to pay higher taxes, sometimes uh, five times the amount of tubing uh, infrastructure, uh, five times more in those kinds of environments. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk to you about this today was this. People are self-reporting. So people who live in auto-dependent exurbs on the edge of big American and Canadian cities, <coughs> they're reporting um, they're less likely to know and trust their neighbors. They're less likely to have uh, friends and neighbors over for dinner. They're less likely to volunteer, play team sports, uh, read the newspaper, or even vote because there's no time. We know that people with more than a 45 minute car commute are more than 40% more likely to be divorced after 10 years. Uh, at the beginning of that 10 years. So these systems are flowing into our lives. And we have to do something about it. Um, the problem is, and I suppose this is why I was so angry during uh, Mr. Nadeau's talk, is that um, American and Canadian cities, these are things we pay lip service and build our bike lanes and our plazas in our central areas. We're getting more dispersed. And even if we celebrate what's happening here in Vancouver in the core, our region is getting more dispersed. It's putting more people uh, in, in a vulnerable place. So 76% of the growth in our region is going to be in auto-oriented areas. So uh, we live in a jurisdiction where our province uh, claims to be a leader in fighting climate change, and yet we're pouring resources into, say, a new bridge that's going to spread people out across the miles. Um, and our local politicians, uh, sorry folks, so, so, so the parade phrase are the sum of the expensive infrastructure you want to go out to, say, Langley, um, uh, is going to very, very uh, uh, um, poorly populated areas. Anyway, we'll argue about that after, right? Or talk to Alex Boston, because he'll kick your ass on data. Um, okay, so what do we know? What do we need to do in order to create, I'll just say it, more equity and more inclusion when it comes to our movement? Um, we need to move beyond the course. We need to think about the edges. We need to think about connecting these places. So. So we're like, this is all I'm giving you today. Uh, we are one. We love each other. We already know this, that people who move by bike are the happiest of all commuters. Okay? We know that drivers, not so happy. We know that people on transit are self-reporting more fear, rage, and sadness in their journeys than any of the people moving in any other way. Partly because we have disinvested so much in, uh, in transit in cities. So hold on to that because I'm just about to contradict it. Um, one of the most extensive studies, longitudinal studies, on travel behavior and well-being came out a couple years ago from the UK. What they found was that, oh, actually transit really does make people happy. So it's a head scratch. You think, well, people are saying, oh, I hate my journey. How can transit make me happy? Well, this study is looking at self-reported well-being. Uh, people reporting on the 
how happy they are, they are uh, considering their entire life, not on their journey, okay? And what they found was that when people switch from driving alone to active transportation, walk, bike, and yes, even transit, they are starting to self-report, being happy with their entire lives. So what is going on here? Your journey is making you less happy, but the but you're getting happier in life. And what they figure is this, is that your transit ride is actually a walk. And then it's a ride on transit, and then it's a walk again. That is what is building happiness in these situations. So this is a powerful message for all of us who are thinking about what, what happens when you get off that vehicle. You get out of your car, you get out of the bus. The walking experience matters so much. It's a sacred experience. It should be treated as thus. Therefore, we know when you get out of that transit stop, if you are in South Kensington in London, and there is delight all around you, and a slow, safe social environment, you'll keep traveling that way. We know that if you build, as Dallas did, an extensive light rail network, you may find that ridership goes down after you spend all that money, which is what happened in Dallas, because there's nowhere to go to. And even if there was, it's so incredibly unfriendly. We know that we're trying here in this region. I, I don't know how much time you have when you're here, but in some cases we're, we're doing this well. So Newport Village, Newport Moody, uh, low in GHG, high in walkability, friendly, comfortable. Not everybody needs to live in a tower. There are towers there. There are also townhouses and houses nearby. Super, super high on walk score. And by the way, there should be a line right on the bottom of that street because in a couple of months they're going to get uh, SkyTrain and uh, everybody's going to get moving that way. So we're making improvements. And it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Um, it's not good enough because it's uh, these people are going to cross extremely busy roads just to get to SkyTrain. It's not good enough uh, because it's still an auto-validated environment that doesn't value children, that doesn't value those who have trouble moving around. So I want to leave you with one example before doing a quick experiment with you, okay? Uh, and that's this. The place that's inspired me the most, and the kid who's inspired me the most in my journeys, um, is this little dude? Uh, he's called the uh, vehicular cyclist um, in the long fire. So, look, this kid is five years old. I met him on the first day of school. I was, uh, I was staying with his parents. And he looked up to me uh, on this journey, uh, and he said, we'll go back to school together. And then he said, tomorrow, I'm going to go back to school alone. I was like, funny kid, do his mom. And she said, no, no, yeah, he's going to go back to school alone tomorrow. I said, well, how can that be? Crazy? And she explained that in Bobon, this is the, the experimental community on uh, the edge of Rider, Germany, that in fact, um, this is fine, because the number one is going to be this five kilometers an hour. Um, not 30, which is what we sometimes consider to be safe on our slow streets, not 20, like they do in the end. Why? It's a walking pace. The other thing they've done, so no cars are moving swiftly here. The other thing they've done is, is internalize the external cost of car use. So if you move to Bobon and you have a car, no problem, you're totally welcome. You just have to spend $20,000 on a parking spot in the village. And it's a very nice garage. Um, and if you don't have a car, that's okay. You only pay $5,000. You get to buy a part of a park in the middle of the village. Um, so it means it's less expensive for those who don't want to drive. It also means that everybody begins their day, begins their day with that three, four, five minute walk or bike ride, biking to transit, biking to school, um, like into the office. What it means is that the law itself is a place of an immense ease and sociability and safety where you do send your children out early in the morning by themselves for their journeys, uh, where people are connecting face to face in an easy, trust building way. And that's what I want to finish with. Whenever we meet face to face in our cities, it changes us. And, uh, I'd like you to help me with an experiment that relates in no way to the other experiment we're doing outside of this room this week. Um, so um, it's, it takes about 30 seconds, and I would like to invite you, anybody who doesn't want to participate in this 30 second experiment, uh, put up your hand, please, and that's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's fine. Okay. Um, okay, here's what I need you to do. And, but please, you have, to be, you have to be quiet and listen to me as I lead you through it, um, and, and then you can talk when I tell you to. So first of all, those of you who can stand, please stand. Okay, uh, now, what I'm going to ask you to do is, when I say go, I want you to locate someone near you who 
who you don't know. It must be someone you don't know. I want you to greet that person. I want you to exchange something nice about each other. Just say anything nice. Maybe it's their clothing, maybe it's their smile. Um, go both ways. So there's a, there's a greeting, there's an exchange, you know your, your names, and then once you've done that, mean it, that's 20 seconds. Then I want you to take a selfie of yourself, but pretend that you're old friends. <laughs> <laughs> so you can even pretend you're old friends who haven't seen each other in years. Embody that feeling. And groups of three are fine. Okay, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, so, like I mentioned, he's going to be back on Thursday. 